Welcome back everybody to another city review where we talk about everything city related. You guys asked for it, so here it is. And where are we going today you might ask? Well, let's go have a look, shall we? Tokyo is world famous for being both the capital of Japan and one of the largest and most dense cities in the world. Boasting a population of over 39 million people, it's truly incredible how they've managed to fit everything in and make it still functionable. But how did it all actually get like this? The city of Tokyo began as a settlement near the mouth of the Sumida River along the body of water known as the Tokyo Bay in the mid 1400s. One good reason why this was the original location of Tokyo is the plains near the Sumida River were really rich in soil for farming. Food production served as a factor that attracted people to the area, and eventually businesses and the local economy grew, leading to the development of the city and over time the Tokyo metropolitan area. It was in the period of the late 1800s that the city of Tokyo experienced the most growth in terms of population increase. At the time the city merged with the surrounding areas to form the Tokyo metropolitan area. This merging of the areas is one of the major events that influenced the growth of the city. I should also mention that Tokyo has had several chances to rebuild itself throughout history, the most recent being the Ginza fire and the impact of World War II. The Ginza fire basically destroyed one of the inner areas of Tokyo in 1872, so the local government then used this opportunity to reshape the streets using more of a grid system, saying it was a model of modernization. And although the Ginza grids are there today, since the rest of the Tokyo layout is a little bit crazy, those grid models don't really go far. And in terms of World War II, almost half the city was destroyed by air raids and fires. But not long after, the city actually rebuilt itself and was showcased to the world in the 1964 Summer Olympics. The city of Tokyo gradually expanded towards the Tokyo Bay area and to other adjacent areas near the Sumida River. There are groups of grid roadways, but non-grid roadways interconnect those grid roadways. The expansion of the city was definitely not in an orderly fashion, it was pretty haphazard. The grid started in the early 1900s, but by that point it was hard to implement it since a lot of the city was already built. And even today you can see there's several different separate groups of grids throughout the city. A possible reason for the combination of grid-like roadways and the haphazard roadways is that there were small settlements scattered across the areas in the past. Each of these settlements had their own little grid-like systems. So these original settlements led to the creation of the separate groups of grids, and the non-grid roadways were then used to basically connect the original settlements to each other. And as the city expanded, these non-grid interconnecting roadways remained and influenced the development of new roadways around them. And even today you can still see a very free-flowing layout. There aren't really many constraints in terms of stopping urban sprawl, and when I say constraints, I usually mean bodies of water or mountains. Tokyo is positioned in basically an open plain, making it an ideal location for the growth of a megacity. I mean, they have the Tokyo Bay to the south, however the surrounding areas are generally easy to build on until you get to the mountainsides, but even those are quite far away. It makes me wonder how the city would be if the mountains were just slightly closer and the bay was slightly bigger. Japan has an excellent network of national expressways which crisscross the islands and throughout the country. And since the expressways were largely built on debt, most of them are now toll roads. Apart from national expressways, Japan has urban expressways, which are intra-city expressways that can be found in most large urban areas. And because of the lack of space in the Japanese cities, these expressways are often constructed as viaducts above other roads. 
These double-decker style expressways are very critical in the flow of their traffic, and since the city is so dense, the Tokyo government only had two options, either go underground or up. Now if you look at the Tokyo Bay, there's a huge bridge literally cutting across the bay. That would be the Tokyo Bay Aqualine. It opened in 1997 and the aim of the expressway was to connect Chiba and Kanagawa which are two important industrial regions. It actually cut the commute from 90 minutes down to 15 minutes. It's actually a very interesting bridge because part of it, of course, is a bridge, whilst the other part is a tunnel, which basically allows ships from the left, which is the ocean, to easily pass by to get to the industrial area on the right. With an overall length of 23.7 kilometers, 9.6 of that is actually underneath the bay, which makes it the fourth largest underwater tunnel in the world. Before the tunnel opened, one had to drive all the way around, which was about 100 kilometers along the shores of Tokyo Bay and pass through the downtown Tokyo. One goal expressed during the planning of the Aqualine was to reduce the traffic through downtown Tokyo, but as the highway toll is quite high, the reduction in Tokyo traffic has not actually been as great as expected. Public transport within Greater Tokyo is dominated by the world's most extensive urban rail network. It has about 158 lines, 48 different operators, and almost 5,000 kilometers of operational track, and hundreds and hundreds of stations. Up to 40 million passengers use these rail systems daily, with the subway representing about 22% of that figure. Walking and cycling are more common than in many other cities around the globe. However, private cars and motorbikes play a secondary role in urban transport. The urban rail system in Tokyo does not behave like a single unified network, but as a separately owned and operated system with varying degrees of interconnectivity. Expansions and upgrades do continue for each train lines, however there seems to be some kind of network connection issue, since each of these lines is owned by different companies. And weirdly enough, each of the region's rail companies tend to display only its own maps, with key transfer points highlighted whilst ignoring the rest of the metro area's network. Public buses in Greater Tokyo usually serve as a secondary role, fitting bus passengers to and from train stations and to major urban areas. I should also mention Tokyo's dwindling tram network. Previously boasted about 41 routes with over 200 kilometers of track. Now Tokyo only has a handful of tram lines and light rail lines, and this is probably all due to the capacity and convenience of trains. Green space in Greater Tokyo is, to be honest, it isn't that great, but it also isn't the worst. Currently, only 7.5% of the city has dedicated green space, and if we compare that to other Asian cities, Taipei has 3.6% and Seoul has 26.6% of dedicated green space. And if we convert those figures into hectares, Tokyo has 10,800 hectares for its 2,188 kilometers squared of space. And if we compare that to New York City, it has 12,000 hectares of green space for its roughly 800 kilometers squared of space. So for the overall size of Tokyo, there really isn't that much green space, but when you have such a mega city, it is to be expected. But don't get me wrong, there are still so many lovely parks throughout the city. So, as we all know too well, a challenge facing Tokyo today is the very high population of the city and its metropolitan area. Tokyo remains the most populous city in the world. This is a challenge because of the limited land that can be used in the area. The result of this high population is, you guessed it, overcrowding. Tokyo's roadways, pedestrian lanes and other public spaces experience daily crowding as people flock to the area during peak hours. This high population also significantly impacts the economy of Japan, especially in terms of land prices. Real estate in Tokyo is one of the most expensive in the world. High prices of property are due to limited land combined with the high demands due to high population density. Therefore, the population of Tokyo is a major, major challenge for the city government.
And speaking of challenges, another issue that the city is facing is microclimates. The temperatures within a city can actually be up to 4 degrees higher due to the lack of green space and hard surfaces, such as roads, pavements and roofs. One way the Tokyo government is tackling this issue is through solar heat block pavements. The government has started using these cooling blocks as a way to reduce the amount of heat in urban areas. And to actually take it one step further, these blocks are also water retentive, which actually means when it rains, the water doesn't just build up on the road. It seeps through the blocks into the ground. So far, this is more of a trial. However, there are plans for further extension throughout the city. Okay, so let's talk about future plans. And there are a lot of things going on. Tokyo is set to hold the Summer Olympics in 2020, making it the only Asian city to hold it twice. And to get prepared for this, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government formulated its long-term vision in December 2014 with aim of making Tokyo the world's best city. And those are their words, not mine. Now many of these goals are currently underway, but here's what they actually all include. The first major future plan is the Three Ring Expressway. Parts of it are already in service, but the ring is nowhere near complete yet. And judging by the little map they provide, I think the ring style expressway network is a really great option that you can already see around the world in many big cities. The ring expressways have a lot of emphasis on connecting the summer Olympic sites, but this design will also help the city in the future to battle congestion. Other future plans include expansion of the port of Tokyo and surrounding airports, and also designing for safer and more pleasant public spaces. They also would like to implement more bike lanes throughout the city and encourage the use of bike sharing systems. The government also plans on introducing more water transport options, linking major summer Olympic sites with other significant areas along the bay and rivers. The next future plan I want to talk about is in regards to transport transfers. So early in the video I mentioned how many train lines don't actually connect well with others. The Tokyo government is now implementing designs that basically bring transfer options together. So for example, large bus terminals will replace previously scattered bus stations. There'll be more signage and opening of areas to make it more appealing in general. And although public transport is already a major part of the city, these upgrades will make for seamless transfers between trains and buses, and making it accessible for all types of people. Now since the Tokyo region is really overcrowded, there's a new area that's kind of becoming more popular called the Tama region. Major developments are being undertaken in this area to enhance the livability of the several million people who live there, such as extensions of the expressway and train lines. The area is seeing a rapid population growth, so the government is promoting things like disaster preparedness, job creation, and educating the locals of the importance of the natural landscape since the area is high in biodiversity. Now the last one I want to mention is something very unique and cool. A city doesn't just need one downtown or business area, and the Tokyo government realises this, and is slowly implementing several different business centres around Tokyo. By promoting several different business districts, it reduces the amount of travel for people who commute and work in these districts. It also reduces the amount of stress on a singular downtown area. How they divided these districts up is actually quite clever. The districts are given a theme or a style. Now bear with me as I pronounce all of these suburbs. So for example, Otemachi, Yasu and the Haneda Airport are designated for finance and business. Hibiya is designated for arts and culture. Shinagawa as an international center. Takeshiba the industrial center. Roppongi and Rinkai residential centers. And Toronomon open for any type of business area. So I'm sure in the future they will do more of these that are less in central locations but more rather in outer areas make it more accessible for people in the suburbs whilst reducing commute time. So all this being said, what else can I even say? I mean, the Tokyo government seems to know what they're doing and getting prepared for the Summer Olympics and well beyond that. I'm sure the Japanese will continue to come up with clever methods to combat their overpopulation and continue to be a world leader in the future. Now as for what I can recommend, well, the whole train disconnectability is an issue I keep thinking about, but like I said, the Tokyo government is trying to adjust that. And just before I go, I'd like to say that there's so many different things that I could talk about in the Tokyo metropolitan area. I tried to really focus on future plans and 
other major things going on in the city. Now if there's something else that you think is really important that we all should know, please let us all know in the comments below because I'd love to see everything else going on in the city and I'm sure everyone else would love to read it as well. So thank you all for watching and don't forget to leave a suggestion for the next city. Who knows, maybe it'll be your city.